Um, at this time, I'll introduce um, our keynote speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Barber, um, who's looking at, who, who's talking about the pandemic pedagogy around around the globe. Uh, Michael Barber, PhD, is Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences of Truro University, California. He has been involved in K-12 distance online and blended learning for over two decades as a researcher, evaluator, teacher, course designer, and administrator. Michael's research has focused on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 distance online and blended learning, particularly for students located in rural jurisdictions. This focus includes how regulation, governance, and policy can impact effective distance online and blended learning environments. Michael has a long history with with the field in New Zealand, um, having written several national reports, serving on the governance board of the VLM primary, conducting several research studies, and prove, providing written and oral testimonies for the Education and Science pa pa Parliamentary Committee. So welcome, Michael, and I'll hand it over to you um, to do your thing. All right, perfect. Thank you much, Rick. I appreciate that. And uh... Let me just start sharing my screen here. I've got to find more of my mouse. Oh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. So whoever is the host, you want to... There we go. And oh, that's me on there. I'm still unable to share. And I see Lucy frantically looking for the setting. Ah, there we go. Perfect. I, nope, you had it and then you took it away. Still not there. Does one of us have to come off co-host? Is there a limit on the number of hosts? Zero. There shouldn't be, no. Um, but you should also be able to set it to allow other folks to uh, be able to screen share. You did a second ago, like for... Try now, Michael. Try now? All right. Yep, back again. There we go. Perfect. All right, let me move this out of the way so I don't have to see all the pictures. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. And I thank uh, the folks uh, uh, for the invitation and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Um, so this is the, the title that we basically came up with as I was working with the organizing committee. Um, but really, I just wanna sort of talk a little bit about things that we've seen happening around the world over the past 20 months. Um, many of which I think you guys have largely because you've managed to deal with the uh, virus in um, or the pandemic in, in um, a more, uh, well, being in the United States, I'll come out and write say it, a better way than what a lot of jurisdictions have. Um, I think you've been sheltered from uh, some of this stuff in uh, that we've seen. So uh, before I get started, uh, I wanna you know welcome folks to my university in uh, Torrey University, California, which is, uh, out on Mare Island uh, in lovely Vallejo. Uh, it's a former military base, um, but uh, in much the same way that uh, the way Rick began his session um, or began the session today, um, in North America, we've just started to, um, in the last couple of years, um, really sort of wrestle with reconciliation with our Indigenous folks. So uh, it's important for me to you know, acknowledge that um, Toro University does sit on unceded land that was part of the 1851-1852 unratified treaties. Uh, specifically, it sits on track uh, 296, uh, which was part of Treaty O. Uh, the land is the traditional home of the Karkin people, although Solano County, uh, which uh, Vallejo is located in, um, is also home to the Patwan and Miwok. Um, so consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, uh, Toro is working towards building relationships with our Indigenous communities uh, through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Um, so 
with that and uh, uh, I guess uh, that land acknowledgement completed, um, I want to start today by just taking us back a little bit because as we look at this, one of the things that we want to really be careful about is the language in which we use. And, and Rick in his introduction actually was quite good about it because he made the specific distinction about how when we went to the um, distant forms of learning back when the pandemic first started, it wasn't distance learning as we would know it. It was remote learning. And, and I was very happy to see Rick use that specific terminology uh, when he uh, when he introduced uh, the session, because if you sort of look at the history of, of of distance education at the primary and secondary level, you know we we have correspondence starting in the early 1900s and the the mid 1920s. We have educational radio that that starts happening, and um, you know next door to you guys in Australia are probably one of the biggest users of that particular medium. Uh, in the 60s and late 50s, we had instructional television that started to get introduced. Uh, um, in places like Canada and again in Australia and, and several European nations. Um, in the 80s, we saw the use of telematics or audio graphics a little bit in, in New Zealand as well, although not as much. And then starting in the early 90s, we looked at um, these online forms of education. So, and if you think about the fact that, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, I think it was last year, uh, the VLN uh, as an organization or as a, I guess, a loose uh, coalition or loose network celebrated its 25th anniversary. Uh, that would peg it to the the mid 90s, which is is right where we're to. And it's important that we we look at that terminology because when you think about the, the the nature of any form of distance learning, and I'll use online learning here as an example, and I won't go through and, and read all of this, um, but I will point out some of what I think are the key terms in online learning. Um, you know, and, and when you look at the words that I've got placed in blue as a part of this, you get the sense that this is something that, you know, we have thought a lot about that has been put in place in a very systematic um, and in many cases systemic kind of an initiative that we've put uh, in place. Whereas if you start to look at what happened uh, during the pandemic, or at least when the pandemic first happened. And uh, this is a wonderful article. It's uh, available for free online at EDUCAUSE, uh, the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. Um, and uh, it's, it's really where the term emergency remote teaching started to get its legs. Um, now the article, I'll be honest with you, is focused mainly on higher ed. So you have to, uh, or tertiary education. So you have to sort of get over that. Um, but they operationalized emergency remote teaching as, uh, as they described it in, in this way. And again, I won't go through and read this out for you, but I will point out some of the specific terms that you'll know. And I want you to, as you look at the terms that I've got listed here, compare that with the terms that you just saw. You know, the idea of going from being a carefully planned, a purposeful, and things that were meaningfully selected based upon, you know, thought around the pedagogical and instructional design aspects of it. And when you compare that to things like, you know, a temporary shift that's only due to the crisis circumstance, that as soon as this is over, we're going back to the way things were, that it's not designed to be a robust uh, educational system, that it's simply temporary while the emergency exists. It gives you a really good sense as to sort of how we were thinking uh, about this when the pandemic first began. And in all honesty, I think the way a lot of jurisdictions have continued to think about it. Um, so there's a report that actually uh, I was the lead author on them. Um, you see there's a, a whole whack of us that were uh, involved in it. Um, and you can get it there at that URL if you click on research reports when you go there. Uh, it should be the first one down at the bottom under the special ones. Um, but what it was was essentially a rewrite of a lot of earlier pieces that were written largely for the higher ed level because we wanted to contextualize not just some of the language, but some of the systems that had been developed uh, for more of a primary or secondary school sector sort of perspective. And one of the pieces in particular that we wanted to look at was this, this these multiple phases of the educational response to COVID. Um, and when you look at sort of this transition that, that would have happened uh, throughout the past 20 months, um, it's 
both shocking and not surprising how little progress that we have made working our way through the phases that you see uh, here on this particular chart. Um, so just to sort of go through it, uh, phase one basically was in March 2020, you know, when when things started to close down and everyone was like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Um, you know, the the kids aren't coming to school. They're not coming back. So it's not like it's not like a planned closure where you can send them home with stuff and you can get ready for it and photocopy a whole whack of stuff and give them devices and hotspot. You know, they just you literally in most cases woke up. Uh, one morning or went to bed one night knowing that everything was shut down tomorrow or everyone thing was shut down as of midnight in, in many jurisdictions. Um, so it was that idea of, you know, you saw a lot of really creative things happening uh, throughout, not just, uh, you know, the individual countries, but really around the world where you had teachers that were really going above and beyond trying to provide some measure of continuity of learning for students, knowing that so many of them didn't have the basic aspects of it. And in all honesty, for the first couple of weeks in that first phase, much of what was actually provided um, was not even educational in nature. It was more sort of, you know, that, that idea of the, the, the lower ends of Mas or the yeah the lower ends of Maslow's uh, taxonomy where we were looking just to make sure that they were okay uh, providing them you know with school lunches and those kinds of things uh, that uh, are so crucial to the education uh, system but not educational in nature um, phase two is what should have happened and in many cases what did happen as folks started to get comfortable throughout the rest of the spring semester. So once we got a plan in place where we were able to get devices to students, where we were able to provide them with access to the curriculum, where teachers had a chance to start to put some of that content uh, online or into paper packets or whatever happened to be used. When ministries of education were able to work with uh, national or state broadcasters and, and provide educational programming through television or radio, um, you know, and that's where we started to see a lot more of these kinds of things happening. And uh, if you were, if you're a Twitter user, you probably saw lots of these coming through your stream if, if you follow a lot of teachers, because it seemed like just about every teacher would take a picture of their setup so you could see sort of what they were doing. And, and when you look at what you see here, other than the fact that, you know, in some cases they're out in, out in the porch or the mud room or in someone's bedroom or in the, the corner of a, a living room, um, if you take that out of it, it looks very much like a classroom kind of setup. You know, you've got a teacher in front of the room. Um, in this case, it's a Zoom room. Um, you know, you've got their whiteboard and their other sort of things up behind them that they're using as part of their instructional tools. You know, it's something that's familiar. It's comfortable. It's the type of thing that they were used to doing in the classroom, and they were now just transferring those skills into a separate medium. So if you look at then, I guess, what the shift should have happened. So this gets us, at least in most North American and European contexts, to the end of what was the 2019-2020 school year. And, you know, once you got past that, you would think that we would then start to move into this phase three uh, aspect. Um, in some cases, folks refer to it as a toggle term or a toggle semester, because the idea behind this one is that we don't know what's going to happen with the virus when folks come back to school. So we need to be ready to be able to teach in the classroom with certain conditions happening, um, you know, social distancing, masking, you know, all those other types of things. But we also need to be ready to teach 100% online in case things go bad and we've got to shut things down. At the same time, we need to have a plan in place if there's something in the middle that needs to happen um, where, you know, we need to, we can only bring in a certain percentage of uh, students into the building, or we only bring them in on certain days of the week, those kinds of things. So that's what phase three 
uh, was supposed to, to, to look like. And at least in the European and North American context, most of the schools ended late mid-May to late May to the end of June. And then they would have got started again sometime mid-August to the Tuesday after September. So most of those places had between two and three months to get ready for this. Now, unfortunately, what we saw was, you know, we didn't really get ready for it all that much. Um, you know, teachers, as they started to come back, uh, began to report that they had little to no training, little to no preparation to be able to actually do much of this. You had a whole whack of teachers that within the first month of coming back, many within the first week just resigned or, hey, I've got a hundred some odd sick days built up. Let me take all of them right now so I don't have to deal with this. Um, at the same time, you had districts um, and individual schools that were scrambling, uh, trying to come up with these modified schedules to allow for students to have some in-person learning. And then we had all these different types of, of, of hybrid models that weren't well thought out, that weren't well supplied or teachers prepared for them. And what you started to see was much the same kind of burnout that, that you saw at the end of the 2020 school year. Uh, I remember working with a lot of teachers at the, uh, in the fall of 2020, particularly even as early as late September, basically telling me that they felt June tired and, you know, it was only the third week of, of school. Um, so, you know, and that's probably something I think that many of you have probably, uh, particularly if you've been in certain parts of the country where, you know, you've had these sort of extended lockdowns or uh, you've had these abridged models that you have there. And, you know, this is just on the teacher school side. You know, when we look at what happened on the, the student side, I mean, you know, and it's interesting to look at the dates on some of these. I mean, while some of them were is still in the spring of 2020, when you can sort of forgive districts a little bit for not having things planned out. But many of the dates that you see here are well into the fall of the 2020 school year when we've had a couple of months of remote learning at the end of the previous school year. Then we've had a two to three month break to get ready for this. And now it's like, well, to use the CNN one at the bottom there, now it's October 22nd of the next school year. And I still have a nine-year-old that has to walk and sit outside of the, well, in this case, actually lie outside of the school because that's the only way he can get online. You know, I mean, that's just not acceptable. Um, you know, the, the, the date on the Hawaii one there is from um, the 2nd of November of 2020. Um, you know, so these are just things that you, we started to see. And, and what it caused amongst our students, I mean, we talk about the resilience of our students, but the reality is, is one of the things that makes or breaks a student's learning experience. And one of the things we can say from the research that is probably one of the most impactful factors in student success is whether or not that student feels valued, whether or not they feel like, you know, their teacher actually cares about them having success in their educational journey. And, you know, as you can see from, from some of these examples, and the one from my colleague, Mary Rice, um, you know, which, again, it, in the case she's in New Mexico, um, they would have started, so this probably would have been about the second week of school. And, you know, you can see, can you go to the top right and switch to standard view? I will get Michael to change. I just saw the chat come in and I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Michael. We just got um, somebody comment that um, the slides were a bit small. Um, in the top right hand corner, um, the view, I'm not for attendees, if you can change your view, you might be able to see it better but we can also get Michael to try and um, maybe um, enlarge go to present does that make sense Michael it makes sense I just in all honesty I don't see how I'm going to get any bigger here in zoom I think it's a participant's view so can other participants say tell us that they're seeing that clearly Yeah, because like I can show you, 
It's, it's big on my screen. Is it big on everybody else's screen or just some of you? I think. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. Yeah, um, the participants need to. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's them that have to do it because in my yeah. case, I've got it at 170% and it's taking up. Um, if I made my slide any bigger, it would actually, you lose some of the slide. Like it takes up the whole real estate um, in in the thing. And and I do it this way as opposed to, if I did presenter view, I'd get a little, on my screen, I'd probably get another, uh, I'm going to guess about 8% of the screen that's there. Um, so, and, and um, but yeah, I, I don't know how else I could get it any bigger, to be honest with you. So, because even if I were to get rid of the slide panel, which I just did, um, you know, it's not going to get any bigger without losing some of the screen. Cool. Yep, I. So, um, we got to thank you. It's clear now. Thanks, Michael. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, sorry. I'm, I want to get my little thingy back just so I, I can keep my pace going correctly. Um, so if you think about the um, what actually happened during the last school year, um, the 2020-21 school year in, in North America and in most places in Europe, to be honest with you, is still much more like what we would expect in, to see in phase two as opposed to what we would see in phase three. And for us over here, um, and throughout most of Europe now, we're into really the third school year that we're looking at. I know you guys are just going to be starting in about a month um, for that. Um, and um, But, uh, you know, we're still in that, we haven't moved to this, this phase yet. And I, I want to talk a little bit about this phase, because I think it's an important one, and one that most people don't quite get. And um, it, it's one that I, it really looks at. So if you're not familiar with these OECD reports, I, I'd highly recommend that you do. And I'll have all of the slides up uh, at my website afterwards. So you'll be able to get them and, and all of the links that are here. Um, but they've got this series of reports uh, called the State of Education During the COVID Pandemic. And in addition to sort of the generalized reports, they also have a country studies uh, and based on this survey that was done literally months before the pandemic started, uh, where they asked basically students and parents and educators and school leaders uh, where they were, um, you know, how prepared they were for various things. So um, when you actually read through the country studies, they use COVID as the example, well, you know, how prepared were you for, you know, the closure of schools and those types of things. But the way the questions were worded in the actual survey were different because obviously this was happening before COVID started. Um, and when you look at it, it's actually fascinating. So um, one of the things I will admit, and, and um, probably one of the reasons why I think Rachel asked me and, and the committee asked me to, to speak today is because, you know, when you look at how you guys have fared throughout the pandemic, it's actually been quite good, right? So as you can see on this chart, this represents essentially the number of days that schools were closed from January 2020 to the 20th of May 2021. So it doesn't capture your most recent semester, um, but it, um, it, it, it still gives you, I think, a, a fair representation. And um, what you have here is you can see that New Zealand is down here at 24 days, where the OECD average is up here at over 150. Right now, um, this looks at just national closures. So in the case of most countries, and New Zealand would be included in this, is um, you still have regional closures that will happen that don't get factored into this. Um, and I know just from watching the news, uh, there have been several times where, as an example, like the Auckland area has been shut down while the rest of the country has been relatively open. Um, so this would only be looking at those national closures. But I mean, you can sort of see how much of an outlier, um, you know, New Zealand, with the exception of Finland, which is just under the bar, New Zealand and Norway are the only ones that really are well below the, well, that are below the, the, the 50 day mark at all. 
And as you can see here, I mean, over half of them are past the 100 mark, uh, some past the 250 mark. Um, so you can get a sense as to sort of how much a lot of the school systems have been disrupted compared to what you see um, within the, the New Zealand context. And, and it's important to note that because when you think about that level three, that phase three that I was talking about, that position where you can toggle back and forth between uh, remote learning and in-person learning, you know, there's some things that should have happened after the original school closures, right? And the first thing that should have happened is the simple fact that when you look at the fact that even in New Zealand, we lost 24 school days. That's three and a half weeks of schooling. Um, actually, almost four weeks of school. No, five days a week. Sorry, I'm a social studies teacher, so the math is a little difficult. Um, that would be almost five weeks of schooling. It'd be a day shy of five weeks of schooling. Um, I don't know why I thought there were seven school days in a week, but um, anyway. So, you know, you lost almost five weeks of schooling. That means that the kids are five weeks behind every time they start a new term compared to what they would have been, say, the previous year or five years ago or 10 years ago when you go through that. Um, some of those jurisdictions lost like 180 um, school days, you know, which is basically a full school year when you add them all up. What things do we have in our curriculum that are absolutely necessary for curriculum continuity? And then what are things that we ha just have in there because it's good for a fifth grader to know? or good for an eighth grader to know, right? Because if you lose, say, 20% of your semester, you can't cover 100% of the objectives. You can only cover, at best, 80% of the objectives, assuming that there's no further disruptions, which means that the next year coming through, the students are already starting 20% behind. And in that new term, you can't teach 120% of the content you know, the 100% you would normally do and the 20% that they missed. So figuring out what things we can drop from the curriculum and making that in a more standardized way is something that every Ministry of Education should have done um, in, you know, worldwide. Something that I haven't been able to find a single Ministry of Education anywhere in the world that did that. Um, you know, similarly, there were things that happened during those 24 days that were very good tools that were used that were incredibly effective, tools that were used that were very much a flop, pedagogical strategies that we tried that worked really well, things that, you know, we tried that were an absolute flop. Having some sort of systematic examination of what those things were for a particular school or within a particular region or just within a grade level across a full jurisdiction would have been important learning to have because then that would have allowed the folks who needed to go into remote learning or had to go into some form of hybrid learning, essentially what we've learned from this experience. That data collection hasn't happened or when it has happened, it's happened in an ad hoc fashion. Um, and it's important that those kinds of things happen because you know if you look at how countries manage this, um, you know, one of the things that New Zealand did quite well, so this is a chart here, all the countries down the side, I mean, you can see the different types of technologies across the top, and they look at it based on, you know, primary education, lower secondary, and then upper secondary. And if you just locate New Zealand down there, you'll notice that with the exception of providing mobile phones to the primary folks and doing anything with educational radio, most schools, or at least from the Ministry of Education's perspective, they believe that the um, other options were provided for during the school closure so that schools had the option of being able to you know, provide take-home packs, uh, provided the option to use instructional television, uh, provided other distance learning modalities beyond just online platforms. You know, when we look at just the online learning aspect of it, and, and well, I should say the distance or remote learning aspect of it, you know, how effective were we in getting devices and connectivity in the hands of students? Um, you know, what tools do we need to um, decide that are institutional tools? Um, I always use the example, one of my colleagues in the College of Pharmacy has three kids. 
And um, one was in grade five, one was in grade eight, seven, and one was in grade eight, all in the same school district, two of them in the same school. Um, for one of the children, the teacher decided just to use the learning management system. And they used everything in the learning management system. So that's where they submitted assignments. That's where content was delivered. That's where the students actually participated in their discussion forms. One of the kids, the teacher decided that they were going to use voice threads as their um, tool for their discussions because the teacher knew how to use it and thought it was much better than what the, um, the uh, learning management system uh, did. And the youngest, um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the tool now, and it's blanking on me, um, but it's a, a popular video-based one. You're limited to five minutes. Um, I want to say Flipgrid, but it's not Flipgrid. TikTok? It's, Has it TikTok? No, it's a web-based one where you basically would post a, a question or a video and everyone can post their own video in response to it. It's not coming to me, but uh, I lost it. But, you know, this one parent had three kids all in the same school system. And for the purposes of doing online asynchronous discussion, they were using three different technologies. So it's not like the older kids could help the younger kids in using it. The parent had to try to figure out how to troubleshoot all three of them when things went wrong. Um, you know, we've got, you know, teachers that are uh, in districts and schools that are buying content from places. Others are expecting teachers to build their own content. You know, we've got this haphazard model that's going all over the place. And it's interesting because when you look at the school preparedness, so when you look at the country studies, uh, so this is based upon the, the, the survey that was done essentially the year before COVID happened. And when it comes to ICT learning, this is what the principals and the, 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 the students felt that they could do, that they were prepared to do um, prior to the pandemic. And it's interesting because the green dots are basically the New Zealand responses. The blue dots are the average, and then all of the gray dots are basically everyone else's response. So you can sort of see the range that you get there. And in each of those cases, it looks like New Zealand was much more prepared to be able to shift to remote learning than pretty much any other jurisdiction. Um, you know, if you look at the first one, there's actually a number of them that are closer to the bottom. But when you look at the second item, you know, that um, whether or not there was insufficient internet access, um, only 3% of the principals said that. I said quite a bit or a lot. And there's only, I think, one jurisdiction that's below that. When you look at the next one about students who, whether or not they agreed with the principals um, when they said that they, they had an effective online learning support platform available, there's only three jurisdictions that are above New Zealand. Um, on the next one over, the fourth one, probably about five or six jurisdictions that were felt they were more prepared on that front than New Zealand. And then when you look over at the last one, there's only four dots that are lower than what New Zealand is on that. So when you compare the roughly 60 countries that you see here, you know, New Zealand seems to be near the top on most of these cycles, um, at least from the principal's perspective. You know, and when you look at even just the, the students, um, this is, I, I find quite interesting, you know, the, the number that reported they had a computer at home, 92%. The number that said that they had a computer that actually could do schoolwork at home, 79%. The number that said they had a good place, a quiet place to, to actually work, uh, you know, at home, um, 89%. Um, you know, students who report to having a quiet place to study uh, based on the bottom quartile of still socioeconomic status, still 80%. Um, you know, and now if you notice, you're much closer to the OECD average on all of these student measures. And with the exception of the ones that say they've got a computer that they can use at home to do schoolwork on with the bottom quartile, um, the range is much smaller on the other three than, than what you saw in the previous one. But at least students and um, in the previous one, school leaders thought that you guys were well prepared, not knowing what was going to happen, um, but the ability to use ICT to be able to replace teaching. Um, from the standpoint of teacher preparation, at the phase three level, these are the things that should have happened. 
not just for say the folks that are in this room because you know i understand that the 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 40 50 people in this room are the exception when it comes to um our educators within the system you know the fact that you're doing you know this kind of an event um you know after the school year as the school year is closing out um says already that you have a much greater interest in the use of online and distance learning than what the average teacher would have and that's one of the things that you know i want to stress because it's one of the things that i think a lot of folks like us in the field often forget you know that we really are the outliers within the system and the vast majority of our colleagues don't think act or perform like us when it comes to uh, issues around distance and online learning but if you go to the data from 2018 so again the year before the pandemic happened when teachers were asked uh, whether or not they would frequently or always let their students use ICT for projects. 80% uh, of New Zealand teachers said they would. Um, when asked if um, they used ICT in teaching um, as if it was in part of their formal educational training, 6 out of 10, 59% said yes, they were trained as part of their former, uh, as the part of their formal education to become a teacher on how to use technology to teach. 76% um, said that they felt that they felt they used digital technologies quite a bit or a lot. 73% felt that um, they had uh, taken professional development activities that had allowed them to get ICT skills for a pedagogical purpose. And only 14 of them, uh, or only 14%, I should say, indicated that they had a high level of need for PD when it came to using ICT with teaching. Um, so again, looking at these, and again, the green dots are always uh, more favorable than what the blue dot or the OECD average is. Um, so at least when, you know, the year before the pandemic started, um, the, the educators in New Zealand felt kind of prepared. Um, I, I'm not sure if you were to talk to them a year after the pandemic happened, if you would get the same kinds of things. I know that uh, I've been involved in a, a series of studies that have been going on in Canada uh, with the Canadian eLearning Network. Uh, and we've produced actually six reports now that have looked at various stages throughout the pandemic. And for the most part, we've actually found that um, teachers were quite ill prepared. And for that matter, if you go back to some of the things we were looking at when it came to the, uh, at the beginning of the 2020 school year for teachers, uh, you'll remember that only one out of every five of them actually said that they were prepared to teach in a remote context. Um, one of the other interesting things that have come out of this line of inquiry, and we've actually been looking now at other jurisdictions and finding the same kinds of things, for those in the, for those jurisdictions that have had to um, close or that have had to put in place pandemic planning, um, you've tended to see this kind of model. So what tends to happen is that at the beginning of the year, you'll have folks that will plan out, okay, we're going to try to teach in person, but we're also going to provide an option for students to be able to learn at a distance or online because some parents and for that matter, some students are still uh, reluctant to have their kids coming back into the classroom. So we'll give, you know, we'll create an online, full-time online program that allows them to do that. And this one here is truly sort of the online learning program that we looked at in that original definition. So these are programs that are specifically planned out to be distance programs from the get-go. Now, in the in-person version, depending upon what's happening in that jurisdiction, you often see one of three things happening. Um, so sometimes if things are going well, and I think many of you have probably experienced this for much of the past 16 months, um, you're able to do regular in-person teaching uh, there may be some sort of social distancing and masking and other precautions taken, but for the most part, what you actually do in your classroom from a pedagogical perspective, from a curriculum perspective, looks very similar to what you would have done two years ago or five years ago. 
In some cases, you see a hybrid kind of model happening where students are either in the classroom or they're online and they sort of switch up depending upon how the schedule goes. And then there's this third model that um, depending on the jurisdiction, some just continue to call this hybrid. Uh, from the literature perspective, we call it concurrent teaching. Uh, you also see it called co-seeding or co-locating uh, at times. Um, and we also know that in those three instances, if things get really bad, we still may have to move to remote learning uh, altogether. So in terms of the true hybrid model, basically we've seen some version of this. Um, now the specifics will look a little bit different and, and the number of groups may look a little bit different, but essentially you divide up the class or the grade into a number of different groups. And depending upon the day of the week, or in some cases, just what week it is, they may be learning online or they may be learning at a distance. Um, my niece went through this back in Canada. Uh, in her case, they had it set up where they would spend one week online and then they'd spend one week in the classroom. And obviously when you're online, there's the other group is in the classroom and then you switch. Uh, this model, which comes from a California uh, school district, they basically would have people where Monday and Tuesday you were in the classroom, everybody was online on Wednesday, and then that group that was in the classroom the first two days of the week are now learning online in the second half of the week. You know, But if you think about what that actually means for a teacher, um, you know, what you're actually looking at. So say I'm teaching my grade eight math class. Um, actually, I wouldn't be teaching grade eight math because I couldn't even figure out what 24 divided by five was a few minutes ago. So say I'm teaching my grade eight history class, because let's face it, um, I'm not a math teacher by any stretch. What that means is that I've got to plan for the design and the delivery of a lesson on topic A that I'm going to do in my classroom but I've got to provide a, another lesson that's designed and delivered completely at a distance that my students can do on their own because I'm obviously engaged in the classroom while that's happening. And I've got to do that for every topic I teach on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And Wednesday is the only day I kind of get off because I only have to design one set of lessons that day because everybody's at a distance that day. And I, I know I, I said I'm not good at math, so this is why I sort of did it this way. So let's figure out how many lessons I have to actually prepare for that one class in the span of a week. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. That's normally my work week, right? Because if you think about it, if everyone was coming into my classroom or if I'm teaching 100% online, I'm teaching one lesson a day for five days of the week. So that's my work week. So by the time the week is actually out, I've done almost twice the work that I would normally do if I were only teaching in one of those environments. And unfortunately, this is kind of the model that we've seen with many of these. Um, another option that we have seen, and this is probably a little bit better option, is we've seen ones where you have two teachers in the same grade level, and what they do is one person does all of the in-person teaching and one person does all of the distance teaching, even though the students still flip and flop about. So the students actually have two teachers. And this is actually a much better model if you're looking at implementing something like this in your school, because teacher B may be somebody that has, an, you know, uh, that may be immunocompromised or that may be in one of the high risk categories. So having them teach 100% at a distance is actually beneficial for them. And from in a school leader perspective, it actually only means that there's only one of these people that I've got to give additional training and, 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 and professional learning to, to be able to do the additional work that it requires teaching at a distance. Because the other one is actually still going to be doing what they've already been trained to do for the most part with you know that one day exception. But on that one day exception, they can work together. And by having them work together, ideally the way in which this teacher B is actually teaching will start to influence how teacher A teaches in the classroom. So if you have to go with a hybrid model where you don't have all of the students in class on time, this is kind of the one I would recommend. The other one is this concurrent one. And we saw a couple of examples of this a, a minute ago when we were talking about how they were trying to blend teaching in person at the same time as they were teaching students at home. 
So essentially I might have five or six kids, well, actually 10 or 12 kids in my room. And at the same time, I'm being broadcast uh, live to another 10 or 12 or 15 kids at home that are sitting on individual devices um, in their room. So, you know, if you think about what that would look like, you know, this is kind of a typical, um, you know, classroom where you've got some sort of projector up to the front of the room and you've got a computer on the teacher's desk. In some cases, if they've got a laptop, they might be able to move it around and stuff like that. But typically most classrooms only have a single screen, right? And if you're using that screen to put stuff up in much the same way I'm doing here, um, like, I've got to have the chat off to the side because I, you know, it would cover up real estate for you guys. Um, I can't see any of you. I've got that turned off. So, because it covers up real estate for you guys, you know, so if you think about your typical classroom, you've got your whiteboard or your projection thing up at the front, you've got your computer either on your desk or in front of that projection machine, depending upon how old it is. You've got your students set up around the room, however it happens to look. Um, so if you and, you know, the teacher is going to be having, in theory, stand next to one of those two devices in order for the folks to have, you know, a view at home. So when you actually look at kind of what this actually looks like from an educational perspective, you have half of the class that are seeing the top view. And you have half of the class that are seeing some version of the bottom view. More importantly, the teacher in the room has to be looking forward to see the students in the room, but the students are looking this way because all of the students at home are being projected on that projection white screen or that smart board that's sitting behind me. So I can't be looking at my students at home at the same time that I'm looking at my students in the room. It just can't be done. It's a virtual impossibility to do it from a logistical perspective. You know, so the students at home, when they look at things, you know, they can see everybody. So if the screen is being shared, like what you see on the right, you can't see, I'd see everyone. You see four or six people up at the top. So, you know, there's people that aren't being seen there. But when you've got this more, this gallery view over here on the left, you get to see all of your students. So when you're thinking about that student to student interaction, you know, this young lady right here, she can see what those, um, what is it, 14 people are doing and their body language and that kind of stuff, assuming they've got their videos on, of course. However, the students at home, again, remember where the computer is. The computer is either right here or right here. The camera is at the top of the computer. So the students at home, all they see are the two views that you've got on the bottom, depending on where the computer is. They see the teacher standing in front or behind their desk because they've got a desktop and it can't move. Or they see their teacher standing at the whiteboard because the laptop is pushed over there and doing stuff in front of that. The difficulty is in that kind of setup, if the teacher happens to move around the room, and if we were doing a live keynote now, you'd be seeing me do this. Um, this is what the students will see. Right, which isn't exactly a great interactivity for the students that are at home. Um, so for those of you that are teaching, and if you have to go to this kind of concurrent teaching model, this is something that I would strongly advise against doing. Um, and if you do end up in this model, make sure that you end up with multiple devices in your room so that you can actually set it up in such a way where you can see the teacher and see what else is happening. Um, you know, and one of the things I want to, I, I started this talk by going back and talking a little bit about the history. And I want to finish with a, a little bit of a historical aspect because most people think a lot of this stuff has just come about because, you know, we've had COVID for the last couple of years. And that, you know, this is the first time we've ever um, started to, to look at these kinds of things. Uh, yes, Rachel, a swivel device would work wonderful. I've got one over in the room or in my closet there. Uh, the swivel itself costs 200 American and it doesn't come with a device. So you still have to put a phone uh, on it to move it around or an iPad to move it. Um, so, you know, that's another couple of hundred dollars that you've got to uh, set up with it. Um, but so most people think that it's only been the last 20 months that we've kind of, you know, confronted these things. But 
it's important to remember that, you know, this is not the first time this has happened. Um, you know, we've seen distance technologies be used to handle both pandemics and uh, epidemics in the past, um, including in, in your own country. Um, we've talked for years about either because of natural events like snow days over here in North America. Well, I'm in California now, so we don't get snow uh, or natural disasters. We see the same thing with hurricanes here in the U.S. about using online learning as a way to sort of bridge the gap for that. Uh, in fact, in the past 20 years, we've seen a number of jurisdictions that have talked about using online learning for this very type of thing you know, for these types of global pandemics like SARS and H1N1 uh, that we've seen. But yet, for some reason, we were so caught by surprise when this kind of thing happened. You know, this is a, a quote from a, an article that um, I found that was written in 2016, you know, four full years before the pandemic. And look at the things that they want you to make sure you think about. Connectivity device distribution, teacher preparation, instructional modalities, content creation versus curation, right? Sound familiar in terms of the types of issues that we've been struggling with for the last couple of you know, months? Because if we don't do this, I mean, the, the alternative to this is what you see here from my actually my own home province. This is the log or the journal of a school principal in a rural school in Newfoundland during the Spanish flu epidemic. And as you can see here, um, while it doesn't say the school year started on the 3rd of September that year, three weeks into the school year on the 23rd um, was when they actually opened. So they lost the first three weeks because of a smallpox uh, or a potential smallpox spread in the school. They came back on the 23rd of September. And as you can see, um, by the 18th of October, they had closed the school for flu. They opened up again around uh, Armistice Day and they stayed open until February 24th when the school just closed down again. And, you know, so that really is the alternative that we have here if we can't use these kinds of technologies to our advantage. You know, it's either we try to figure out a way to leverage this stuff or we make sure that we um, just are OK with closing the school. Um, knowing that I've got a, an audience full of folks that are likely early adopters of, of online learning, um, I mentioned earlier about the fact that we are the outliers in this. Um, it's important for us to remember and to consider the fact that while online learning has played a significant role in the continuity of learning that we've seen over the past few months, um, it's important to remember that the vast majority of folks haven't had the same positive experience that we have had. Um, in many cases, um, they've had a really bad experience with it. And unfortunately, as you can see from these news items in Canada, none of them have made the distinction that this is remote learning or somehow temporary. They always use language that makes it look like this is the same kind of learning that all of us were providing three years ago. Um, and for many of our parents, it's left a really bad taste, not just parents, students as well, bad taste in their mouth. Um, so this really isn't the opportunity that many of us think it is. In fact, I personally predict that those of us in the field are going to have a difficult time trying to overcome much of the reputation that has been around this. Um, so I know we're at a break time now, and I know that we have a session coming up uh, for conversation for those folks that actually want to talk about this and have some questions around it. And I welcome that. If you're in another room, by all means, email me and I would be happy to chat with you. Uh, but I guess in 15 minutes, I'll get a chance to sit in a room and chat with all of you.